From the studios at WMFE in Orlando, Florida, this is the Space Exploration Podcast asking the question, are we there yet? So in the last episode of this podcast, we talked with Stu McClung. He's the engineer working on the Orion space capsule. And if you remember, this is the capsule that's going to take humans into deep space. Now, the interesting thing about the Orion capsule is that it's being put together at Kennedy Space Center, the place where it will eventually launch. Now, that's a new technique for NASA. Uh, In the past, capsules were shipped to KSC fully assembled. Now only the shell of the capsule is shipped to Kennedy. And once it arrives, some assembly is required, like outfitting the computers, consoles, outer shell, and finally the heat shield. It's all done at the revamped operations and checkout facility. Now this long building, about five stories tall, was once used for final preparations of the Apollo missions, uh, as well as a staging place for parts heading to the International Space Station on the shuttle. Now, the building has been redesigned and remodeled to piece together Orion. Now, today, the Orion capsule that's going to be used on EM-1 is being worked on. What they call the pressure vessel arrives from a factory in New Orleans. And this pressure vessel is basically just the inner shell of Orion with holes cut out for windows and hatches. NASA engineer Scott Wilson and his team handle the rest, and he walked me through the floor of the operations and checkout facility to show me just how that's done. The first thing we'll do is bring it into this tool that you see straight ahead here. It's, we call it the birdcage tool. If you picture it, it looks like an old-fashioned birdcage, but what it does is it helps us find all the location points to put the rest of the structural elements on the vehicle so we can orient the outside of the spacecraft with this pressure vessel, which is the the internal portion of it. We'll put those components on, and then we'll move into this large cell here, which is a proof pressure cell. And what we want to do is once we build the structure, we want to pressurize it just like it would be in space with the atmosphere inside. And we pressurize it a little bit more than it would normally see in flight. And we measure all the welds that are in it and all those structural components to make sure that it can really withstand the pressures we want. So we close these large blast doors in front of us in case there was was a problem. We pressurize it. And uh, when it comes out of there... We move it into this area here, which is a clean room, what we call a clean room, where we keep the atmosphere in there uh, very clean, much like you'd see in an operating room or an intensive care unit. Right, and it's, it looks kind of like a, a see-through uh, segment of the building here, the plastic vinyl where you can see in there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's sectioned off from, from, from out here. Exactly, and the, and the reason for that is while this is a very clean work area outside of it, and there it's, it's extremely clean, and that's important because the propulsion systems we use use oxygen, and if you have contaminants in the oxygen, you can cause combustion uh, where you don't want it, or you could cause uh, clogs in those lines that wouldn't be able to fire thrusters or the life support systems. So the crew module moves in here. We weld in all of those structures. There's lots of tubes that carry all the oxygen and the various components. Those are all welded together in here. Each weld is x-rayed to make sure that it's, uh, that it's proper. Um, and each one is tested uh, individually from uh, both looking at the x-rays and then for cleanliness. And once we've completed those operations, we go back into the proof cell, and this time we pressurize all those systems, again, to verify that the welds are good and the system's operational. How many welds are, are on it? There's uh, probably in the neighborhood of 100 welds on, on this, um, give or take. Yeah. Um, it depends. Some of those we'll do on component levels and then install a large component, so some of those are offline, and then what we call online right on the vehicle, there's others. So, um, Once we're sure all that is done, so now we have the mechanical structure completed and we've tested it, we've got all the tubes and the propulsion systems and environmental control done, we're ready to start the next steps, which is to put in all the avionics. Um, And the avionics is the electronics that actually controls the spacecraft. So we'll begin putting those boxes in and all the wiring that supports that. We'll wire that all up together, and then we'll do what we call our first power-up, where we turn it on for the first time and begin testing all those systems. What kind of an event is that? Is everyone kind of it's, looking on excited? or It, it is. It, it, that's a very big milestone for us. I mean, there's a couple. One is getting the pressure vessel here. The next big one is the power-up event, and that's really where we know how the system's going to start performing, and we can really start actively controlling the vehicle to really run through all those tests we have to do to make sure it's going to perform. 
How do you move it from station to station? I mean, I'm looking at the mock-up yeah. here. It's big. Yeah, it's a <laughs> great question. If you, if you can visualize, uh, the, the best analogy I can give you is we put it on a stand here, and you'll notice the, there's orange pads at the bottom, flat pads that sit on the floor. And it's, it's sort of like an upside-down air hockey table. We pressurize it, uh, the air flows out the bottom, and just two or three people can move a, a many thousand-pound spacecraft around the floor. We, we jokingly say two people can move it, but you want several to make sure it stops. But yeah, no, that, that's wild. So it just kind of it skates it, around here on the floor. Right. It, it hovers on a very thin, you can't quite see underneath it, but a very thin layer of air. Once the avionics systems are in and we power up, um, that really is the point where the uh, the spacecraft, the crew module part of it, is, is kind of coming together as a full unit, and we'll test it to it to be sure it's working. We'll we'll put some things on it that we call back shells, which are the tiles that go around it um, to protect the sides of the capsule from the, the thermal uh, effects of reentry, and we'll put the heat shield on it, which is the bottom part that really protects you from the, the highest temperatures when you reenter. Um, once that's done, the crew module is essentially done, and in parallel with all the things I talked about there, we're building the service module. Um, we, the service module has three uh, major chunks to it. It has what we call a crew module adapter, which is the upper piece of it. That's built here out of composite parts that come in from around the country and a uh, few metallic parts. Uh, there's the European service module, which it comes in as a unit and has some assembly required. We'll put on a nozzle on the engine and some solar arrays and things, but it'll get integrated to that crew module adapter. And we have what we call a spacecraft adapter, which attaches the bottom of the whole vehicle to eventually to the rocket. Those parts will be assembled here, and very similar to the crew module, will weld in uh, propulsion systems where it connects up uh, between the European pieces and the U.S. pieces. Uh, we'll test out the avionics, and then the, uh, the service module will essentially be ready to integrate with the crew module. And just so we can get our, give our listeners a picture, the, the, the crew module is kind of that, uh, that cone on top, and the service module is the, the cylinder underneath it, right? Correct, right, right. When you look at a, a picture of the vehicle without the launch abort system on it, you'll see a conic uh, crew module, similar to what you would see in, in other spacecraft like Apollo, but much more advanced. And then the cylindrical piece behind it is the service module with an engine on the bottom. Um, when it rolls out of the building here for launch, what you don't see is underneath there are solar arrays that are folded up and radiators and there's an engine in there too and so there's some fairings that go over that when it rolls out but as soon as we get on orbit we jettison the fairings and those solar arrays deploy and begin generating power and powering up the spacecraft. So um, what we can do here is we'll walk down to the far end of the building where we have what we call a final assembly and test cell or a fast cell and that's where the two pieces come together the crew module and the service module and we'll, we'll mate those together and at that point, we can really start doing a lot of the what we call integrated testing and performance testing. And, and we, we have a strategy that's called test like you fly. We want to put it through all the paces and make the vehicle think it's flying as much as you can on Earth uh, to test all the things out that we can before we launch. And when you say walk to the other side of the building, I really wish I, I wore my Fitbit today because, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is quite, a, quite a walk. It is. It's a big place, but um, you know, building spacecraft is they're they're big, and uh, it's one of the key things with Orion. Folks who've seen maybe Apollo spacecraft in a museum, they're they're relatively small compared to, to the size of, of this spacecraft. To, to give you an idea, the Apollo spacecraft were sized for three people. Um, the original sizing for Orion was for six people to be able to go to low Earth orbit, um, or for four to the moon. Um, other advancements with it, too, are, are quite a bit more volume for the crew to live and work in. I know we had some of the Apollo crew here uh, near the end of Exploration Flight Test 1, and they were jokingly, you know, among themselves about, boy, what would they do with all that space when they went to the moon? So it's, it's quite a bit bigger, much more capable, uh, much more autonomous. Um, I know when Apollo went to the moon, uh, somebody drew the short straw and said they had to stay with the spacecraft while two got to go to the moon. Uh, Orion's actually capable of sending the entire crew of four to the moon, and the spacecraft can autonomously wait for them to come back. So, uh, for that kind of a mission, um, what's the what's the size of the base? Uh, of the, just so we can get an idea. It's about five and a half, about five meters in diameter total. Uh, the crew module is about three and a half, three point three meters tall. Uh, if you put the launch abort system on there and the crew module and service module, you're probably at um, sixteen, seventeen. 
ish meters tall. So that, that's the one thing that, that took me by surprise is seeing that mock up. You know, you, yeah. you see the pictures, you see what you think it's going to look like, and, and it's much bigger than it actually than you think it is. And, and it even snuck up on us when we built the first one. You know, you, you realize it's big, but when you put the whole thing together and we were rolling out to the launch pad and we went by one of the buildings here at Kennedy, and you realize it's as tall as maybe a six story building, five or six story building, it's, it's an amazing, amazingly large rocket or spacecraft. So, um, Let's see, we talked a lot about the assembly process of it. The mission, this is actually our third mission for Orion, third flight mission. It's our, our fourth spacecraft build. We did build what we call the ground test article years ago, which was a structural article to really learn how to build it and to be able to run it through tests to understand the structure of the vehicle. Um, one of the things that's important to us is getting the mass as low as possible, but still strong enough to survive the flight. So that first vehicle helped us understand where we could take mass off, where we had to add more structure. Uh, the next one was the Padabor 1 test out in uh, White Sands, New Mexico, to test the ability of the launch board system. Uh, then, of course, we flew Exploration Flight Test 1 back in December of 14. Um, it was a, about a four-and-a-half-hour mission, two orbits around the planet, and its primary purpose was to test those spacecraft systems like the avionics, to test the re-entry systems, the ability of the heat shield to withstand that thermal environment coming in. It was a relatively went, high orbit, right? It Just was, so you could test yeah. that out. It was about 3,600 nautical miles out, came in about 20,000 miles an hour, which is um, about 80% of what you'd see coming back from deep space or a lunar mission. Um, and it got to, um, I think it was around 4,000 degrees coming in. So it, it's very hot, but we wanted that highly elliptical orbit to get those speeds to really test the spacecraft in its environment. Um, this current mission we're working, uh, which is Exploration Mission 1, if you think the flight test was far, we're going about 40,000 miles beyond the moon in this flight. So the moon's 240,000-ish miles away, another 40,000 around it will be in what, what we uh, call a distant retrograde orbit around the moon. Uh, this mission, instead of being a few hours long, this one's going to be uh, about 19, 20 days long, and we really want to be able to push the boundaries of what the vehicle can do to really make sure we understand uh, how well we've designed it, um, what things we might have to tweak before we put crew in it. Um, so when it comes back, it'll be similar to those, to those velocities we saw, a little higher velocities coming back in, but it'll essentially test out the whole spacecraft in an uncrewed format to prepare us for the next flight after that exploration mission two which we'll have crew on so right because when when that capsule comes in in, in the atmosphere it, it's it's kind of like you know jumping in belly flopping into a lake or something right you, it, it is it's a good it's a good analogy for it because when you come in and you hit the atmosphere we think of air as being very thin but when you're going 20,000 miles an hour it's it's hitting something pretty hard and it generates quite a bit of heat um, and we have to be able to take all that heat and ablate it away from the spacecraft to keep the, the crew safe and keep the vehicle safe and protect all those systems that you need minutes later, like parachutes and things uh, to deploy, which are very fragile. So you, it's, it's, a, it's like stopping a bullet. What, what is this for here? This great, great question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I talked to you about the uh, final assembly and test cell, the mm -hmm. fast cell. So this is a, a, a large portion of the facility that actually goes down into the basement, which is rare in Florida, but because of the height of the spacecraft, we actually had to go down a little bit more. This is where we'll bring in the service module, uh, the spacecraft adapter and the service module. We'll set it down there in the basement floor. We'll stack the full service module on top, the crew module on top of that, and this is where we do all that final testing of the spacecraft. Okay. So. How many people would you say... How many hands go into actually assembling this uh, here Great at Kennedy question. Space Center? Great question. We have, in total, anywhere between, and it varies by what work we're doing, but it, it is about the 250 to 300 people, Mark. That includes the NASA people working on Orion, the Lockheed Martin, our prime contractor uh, personnel, as well as, uh, as the technician labor that actually puts the spacecraft together and really does the real work for us. So uh, about 250 to 300 at any given time, which is... Um, much less than shuttle, which is good. We've improved quite a bit, um, and we've learned a lot of things with technology where we can do things uh, easier, faster. So. Does does having all of that stuff happen happen in one spot? Does that kind of help uh, with the efficiency of the program as well? Yeah, I think there's there's probably two efficiencies. There's an efficiency for Orion having us do all this stuff here in this building and, and locally. I think there's an efficiency at Kennedy Space Center too because where um, where we need other services, for instance, like um, transportation moving large parts around or 
precision cleaning or laboratories or machine shops, uh, we can rely on the infrastructure at Kennedy to uh, buy that by the drink, kind of, instead of having to stand up our own capabilities. And then other contractors on site, whether it's SpaceX or other, can, can use those facilities as well. So I think it really helps all of us together as a community of spacecraft builders and launch vehicle builders to, to have that here. So. I know that uh, like all of the development between the three systems, between the Orion, between the ground systems, uh, between the space launch systems, all those are being developed together. Uh, is there any challenges with not knowing the exact specifications of the rocket, per se, or the exact specifications of the launch pad at this point? Yeah, the, the three programs are, while they're three independent programs, there's a strong integration between those three where we share things. Uh, a great example is, you know, the rocket produces thrust, which produces what we call loads, which can stress the vehicle. So we, we share loads data back and forth between SLS of what they think they're going to, what kind of loads they'll put into our vehicle. That impacts our design. We feed our design of our mass back to SLS. And so there's an awful lot of back and forth that happens every hour of every day between those those real smart, real rocket scientists scientists that are putting that stuff together. So there is a, there is a lot of integration necessary, uh, but it occurs. And it's, it's fairly seamless. I think for Orion, having the final production here at Kennedy is helpful, too, because it's also where the ground operations and development program is who are building the launch pads, building those other facilities. And so we have their personnel come in very often to see what we're doing. If there's concerns about how something we're doing might fit later in another facility, we can work those things out way ahead of time uh, because of that co-location. What are what are some of the big milestones you have to reach here at this facility? So I think, uh, again, the pressure vessel, what we call the pressure vessel, begins the process for the crew module. Uh, it comes in uh, February 1st, uh, weather permitting. Um, all the rest of the things we do, it's about um, roughly another eight months to a year when we do our final power-up. We'll spend about a year and a half in the building here doing all the things up to the fast cell and to that test. Uh, we'll spend about two or three months up at Plumbrook and then come back. So it's uh, while it seems like a long time, for those of us that have to put it together, there's a lot, of, a lot that's got to come happen in that period. There's about 300,000 parts that come together to make a spacecraft, and so you can imagine every one of those parts needs to arrive, uh, be inspected, tested, and then assembled, and then tested as an integrated vehicle. So it uh, seems like a long time, but not, not so much. The, the, the first test flight back at the end of 2014, you're looking at the, the heat shield, looking at kind of the, the structure of the capsule. What are you going to be looking at in, in this EM-1 test flight specifically? From uh, goals and objectives of what we're trying to get out yeah. of it, or I, I think um, probably our biggest our biggest objective is this is the first flight of a full-up service module, right? So it's uh, that's a big chunk of what we're trying to do is make sure that we're integrating the European pieces properly with the U.S. pieces and make sure that that service module really performs. We'll actually be using the engines, using the thrusters, generating power. Those were things we didn't do in EFT. Um, the other thing is the difference in duration of those missions is significant for us, right? The, the EFT was really about testing the avionics and the ability and those, those systems for reentry and landing and parachutes. Um, for, for this flight, we really won't need to test all the systems that are necessary for the crew, and we want to make sure we get enough data on that to know that it's safe to put crew on. So that's the reason for a much longer mission, um, you know, 19, 20 days as opposed to a few-hour flight. So that will be um, a big thing we're looking at is how do those systems perform not just for short-term but for long-term. So. And how many capsules are there? There's, um, this is actually the fourth capsule we've built, uh, fourth major capsule. We have some things called um, pathfinders that will build portions or mock-ups or things. But we started with the ground test article, which was for the structural, learning about the structure. Uh, then we built the pad abort one capsule, which was really meant to simulate the mass properties of the vehicle, but not really significantly what like you'd fly in space. Overall. Exactly, yeah. You had to, if you're going to test the launch abort system's ability to pull the capsule away, it's got to have a similar center of gravity and similar mass, but, but that's really where the similarities ended. Um, then we, the EFT capsule itself, and then we just built, uh, like I mentioned, a Pathfinder to test our tooling in New Orleans, and then we've built this pressure vessel here. So, so four to six if you count the mock-ups. The, the reason I ask is, is reusability of those capsules in, in the long-term plan? No, great, great question. We did a lot of assessments looking at should we be fully reusable, kind of like shuttle was, or fully disposable like Apollo was. And the answer turned out to not. We, we expected a simple answer one way or the other. The, ex, the answer is actually it's in between. Uh, things like reusing the structure requires a tremendous amount of labor to essentially take all the parts back off 
do all those inspections that you need to do on things like welds and stress and put it all back together. So it turns out the structure of the vehicle, that, that big outer metallic structure, doesn't make a lot of sense to reuse. It actually costs more if you try to reuse it. So that's disposable. But um, things like the avionics and the seats and thrusters and engine components, uh, which are typically your higher dollar things, um, those can easily be reused. And so our plan is to take those types of things out of the vehicle from one flight, send those back to the various vendors that provide them to be uh, retested, and they'll come back and be reused on a subsequent flight. Perfect. And so this, this whole building is kind of uh, just assembling for, for launch. There's no post-mission processing that happens here? Um, what we do is uh, for Exploration Mission 1, for instance, when it when it lands, it'll it'll land in the Pacific. Uh, ground operations working with the Navy, uh, similar to EFT, we'll use a well deck ships to um, recover that vehicle. It'll come back into a facility at Kennedy uh, where they'll um, take off any residual fuel. Some of those fuels are toxic. We want to make sure we take those off before it comes into a work area. And it'll come back into this building where we will do those final, um, final inspections on it. And then, of course, we'll begin to take components off that we want to reuse. Why is it important that we're putting humans into in, beyond low earth orbit? Can't we learn enough from from you know uh, probes or, or, or uh, you know rovers or whatnot? Why do we have to send people? Yeah it's a, it's a great question and, and I've heard that a bunch. Uh, robots are doing some amazing things. When you look at the types of things that uh, JPL does for instance with Mars rovers and that kind of thing uh, it's amazing what we're learning. Hubble Space Telescope, we're learning tremendous things, and we will with things like James Webb Telescope and others. Um, but we, we, as you go farther and farther from the planet, there's the, the time lags between trying to send a command to something, and in, uh, in, in Mars, I, I believe it's about a 40-minute delay by the time you send command. So you can imagine if, if you have something that's happening in real time or just something you're trying to go examine, having to send commands back and forth and wait 40 minutes between every maneuver um, takes a long time, and, and so you either have to make those robots so smart that they can adapt all that, which maybe someday we'll get there, but we're not today, uh, that having humans there, it becomes much more intuitive, things are much quicker, and so that's our, our goal, is to be able to send the robots first, to do those kind of things that are either dangerous for people to do, or those early scouting things, or even things where you begin to use resources on planets and have things ready for, for humans, uh, those are great jobs for robots. When it comes to exploration, having a person there really helps you quite a bit in what you can learn and how quickly you can learn it. Not to mention, it's really cool, too, right? It is really cool. I, th I think it's, uh, you know, at some level, I think it's in human nature to explore and to try to, to, to do, you know, go places you've never gone before and learn. So it's always a hard question. People ask that. You know, I, people probably ask that for years to Columbus and Lewis and Clark and folks, too, and it's always hard to put yourself in the, their shoes and ask, what are you going to learn? Well, it's hard to tell what you're going to learn, but history tells us you always learn something new. So. That was NASA engineer Scott Wilson giving me a tour of the operations and checkout facility and the work they're doing assembling the Orion deep spacecraft. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Support for Are We There Yet comes from the listeners of WMFE. You can follow the show online or on Twitter at AWTYMars or reach out to me in the Twitterverse. I'm at Space Brendan. Are We There Yet is a production of WMFE. Find more space news online at WMFE.org space. I'm Brendan Byrne. Thanks for listening.